Good afternoon. My name is Leif Barry and I work here at the Phoenix Park Visitor Center. Today is part of our Biodiversity Festival Lunchtime Talks. I'm delighted to introduce three of our speakers from three different OPW sites around Ireland. Telling us about the fantastic work that they are carrying out to help biodiversity conservation on their sites. Firstly, we will have Rory Finnegan, head gardener with the OPW at Castletown Demise, Selbridge, County Kildare, for his talk on floral pollinator meadows of Castletown. Followed by Chris O'Neill, park superintendent with the OPW, and Derry Nan, County Kerry, for his talk on Derry Nan and the Natter Jack Toads. And lastly, but not least, then we will have Dr. Colin Kelleher, taxonomist, National Botanic Gardens, Glasnevin in Dublin for his talk, Dried and Frozen, bringing plant diversity back to life. For a full list of our Biodiversity Festival programme, please visit our website, www.phoenixpark.ie. Without further delay, I will hand you over to our speakers for their insightful talks. Thank you. Okay, uh, this presentation is about the award-winning pollinator friendly meadows in Castletown. Um, uh, just to give an overall idea of the estate itself, it's 240 acres. Uh, it's made up of mixed woodlands, semi-natural grasslands, riparian scrub, uh, tree-lined avenues, and uh, ponds and ha-ha ditches. And each of these uh, different habitats have been managed for wildlife and for public amenities since 2007. Um, I'm just going to cover the grassland management section uh, this, this morning, but I'd like to put the, the domain itself into context uh, for you. It's, it's physically actually an island, if you look at it from, from a biodiversity perspective. We are surrounded uh, on the north and the west by uh, motorway and urban spall, uh, to the east by industrial estates, and to the south by the beautiful river Liffey. Uh, this means that it's, it really is a critically important uh, refuge for the plant and animal communities who actually depend on it for their survival. The, the grasslands themselves have been categorised as GS1, which is dry calcareous uh, uh, grasslands, and GS2, which is dry meadows with a, a grassy verges. Now this is really of great importance, uh, as it's likely that this is the last substantial habitat of its type in the county and it really needs to be pre pre preserved and uh, held in high esteem. Uh, could I have the next picture, please? So we have two grassland management regimes. Uh, this picture sort of, uh, will indicate it. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see really rough grassland. Uh, that's managed like that. It's only cut once every five years. Uh, the biomass is actually left on site and it encourages this absolutely uh, rank vegetation. And there's a, a rationale for that. In, in 2008, when we did our, our baseline studies, uh, we found that we had barn owl hunting along that 20 uh, acre uh, linear strip along by the River Liffey. So we decided to manage the grasslands differently. Uh, this, this type of habitat is fantastic for shrews and mice. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to encourage uh, that, that whole ecosystem to, to, to work. Up top left, you'll see the, you know, the grassland is much more level. Uh, that's the second type of, of, uh, of regime that we use, uh, where we cut and remove once per year. So we're cutting in September, um, uh, uh, what you call it, and this gives us a succession of flowering plants throughout from spring all the way up to autumn. So basically the, 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 the species list the way it works. In, from April to June, we start off with dandelions, really important uh, plant for bumblebees coming out of hibernation, followed by cuckoo flowers, uh, bulbous buttercups and yellow rattles. Now the uh, uh, yellow rattle is a really, really important plant for uh, meadow management. It's uh, hemiparasitic, so it actually reduces the, the ranker grasses and makes the, uh, the sward much thinner, which is great for, for uh, our native uh, uh, wildflower plants. Could I play the, the next one, please? Uh, it also gives a constant food supply throughout the whole summer uh, for uh, bumblebees and our other pollinators. So the, uh, from June to September, uh, we have a whole mosaic of colors where we have uh, orchids, pyramidal orchid, common spotted orchid, uh, and bee orchids have made an appearance in the last uh, couple of years. Um, 
what you see in the picture here is our plants like birds for trefoil, wild carrot, yarrow, a knapweed and hawk pits. Um, just an absolutely beautiful scene to see. The, um, by providing this type of stable habitat, many species uh, survive and thrive and complicated ecosystems can develop. Now, just can we have the next pictures, please? I just wanted to show you some of the examples of uh, the wild uh, creatures and the biodiversity that actually live in, in, in meadows. It'll show just shortly after this, this uh, video. So this uh, is a fungus uh, called uh, Clavaria vermicularis, white spindles. I'm told it's rare. It's also edible, uh, but I ain't gonna try that. It doesn't look really appetizing. Could I have the next one, please? Now, this is a red mason bee. We have a program uh, of management for these bees in Castletown uh, since 2019, and we're providing uh, cocoons from this species to uh, Trinity College and to the National Botanic Gardens for uh, education and environmental research. Um, you can see it, this is one of our solitary bees. Uh, it's very hairy, which is why they're such good pollinators. Um, the next slide, please. This beautiful little thing uh, has a, 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 a sort of a different, different situation, different story. Uh, it's a ruby-tailed parasitic wasp, and that is a parasite of the, the previous species that I showed you, the red mason bee. Uh, so these, you know, you have these fantastic little situations, these little uh, ecological connections happening all the time. Could we have the next one, please? This is an, uh, the ashy mining bee. So again, this is another solitary bee, but it's, it's a miner. And we managed our ha-ha ditches uh, for this particular species and for other species of mining bee. Um, a gorgeous thing, big black and white bee, can't miss them. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? And this species is a Nomada marshmallow. It's a solitary cuckoo bee, not a wasp. Uh, and this is a parasite on the, the on the Yashi solitary bee. So again, you have all of these connections. Uh, you know, there's 77 species of solitary bee, and I've just shown you, you know, uh, three or four species. Next, please. Um, this is a common butterfly. Now we have 15 species uh, have been identified in, in the grounds of Castletown uh, by uh, Butterfly Conservation Ireland. This is a new species in Ireland, it's expanding its range and it only became apparent that it was on site two years ago. Uh, so it just shows that what we're doing is actually having, you know, absolutely concrete effects on the ground. Uh, we're actually attracting in new species. Um, that's the last slide, but I would just like to say that, that, that this whole um, presentation couldn't have been done without the staff on the ground. Uh, they actually do all of the work, I just point fingers. And I would like to thank uh, very much uh, Bridian, Pavel, Mark, Robert, uh, and Garrett uh, for and Ward for all of their help over the years. And thank you very much. Just wait for the next slide to come on. Yeah, so I'll just start off with a, a very quick overview of Dairy Nan. We have um, Dairy Nan House, the family home of Daniel O'Connell in the centre, um, 120 hectares of the, the landscape domain. Um, there's, in terms of habitats, uh, there's over 30 hectares of uh, native woodlands, including old oak woodlands of uh, national importance, sorry, international significance, uh, one and a half kilometres of coastline, including Abbey Island with Heathland, and you have this um, kind of extensive dune grassland habitat uh, along the coastline. So that's managed for wildlife and the site supports a range of rare species. You can see bottom left there, it's the, the main overwintering site on the Avra Peninsula for Truth, which is the bird there, and it's also the, the Kerry Lily. There's a kind of rare suite of flowering orchids, including the bee orchid that uh, Rory mentioned as well, the castle town. That's an amazing uh, looking flower. And uh, the narrow mouse wall snail as well, which is kind of famous or infamous for um, the um, the, the kind of motorway schemes and then obviously they've been along the coast there's both kind of underwater and kind of marine ecology as well so just to give the, the brief overview there and um, there's two overlapping um, EU mature designations which the whole of the site falls under 
so that you know the whole site is protected at an international level. Uh, so obviously there's a, a lot of things going on. I'm just going to talk about the Natajak toads there today, which are um, you can find them on our Sea Shaw Nature Trail that was launched in 2016. It was a public private partnership. It's a downloadable app and it just highlights like the kind of wildflowers and um, pollinators, butterflies, moths, birds, and so on, and brings in the, the Natajak toads. So this is the, the Natajak toads there. So they're protected under Annex 2 of the Habitats Directive, also the, the Wildlife Act, and they're Ireland's rarest and most endangered amphibian. And they actually went extinct at Derryland uh, sometime between the 1940s and the 70s, and they were reintroduced in the 1990s. So that's just showing how, I suppose, tenuous their current um, status is. There's just a handful of sites around the Dingle Peninsula, a translocated population in Wexford and the, the one in Derry Nan as well. And you can see there at a national level, the range is bad, population bad, inadequate habitat and future prospects. Overall assessment is bad, but at least um, the overall trend is improving. And it just emphasises how important kind of OPW sites like Derry Nan are in terms of conservation of species like Nabajak toads. Um, so that's Derry Nan there. Uh, of the, the kind of mountain and Abbey Island. All the, the Nadajak toad activity is centred on these two ponds here and the kind of few out on the rocks as well. Um, so there, the ponds were created in 1990s and Nadajak toads were brought down from Dingo Peninsula. So the population at Derrynan is stable. It's monitored annually by the NPWS, like third year model would come down most years. Um, and assessments will be made of the numbers. So there, it has been increasing in recent years. I think there were nearly 20,000 um, toadlets last year in 2020 um, and 15,000 uh, the previous year. Um, nationally, in terms of threats to habitats, the main ones would be poor grassland management, um, natural succession where the ponds start becoming overgrown and uh, loss of habitat and pollution and um, inadequate graze and because yeah, the grass needs to be kind of kept really low for them and um, to be able to make the way around. So we're working to ensure that none of those threats occur at Derry Nan. Uh, we receive around 200,000 visitors a year. Uh, last year with the staycations we had over 300,000 and we expect the same this year as well. Obviously we don't have ranges so we rely on education and uh, that's kind of massive thing to encourage the regular visitors and the, the kind of holiday makers to avoid disturbing the toads. They kind of we tell them about their, their life cycle, uh, where they're located, how important they are, and you know how to kind of avoid disturbance. A few years ago, people were actually had kids and um, paddling in the ponds, you know, so that's an important thing. And they're in Irish as well. Um, so this is the, the last slide, a very kind of quick overview. The, the June grasslands are grazed by cattle. So the, the dunes are grazed during the winter and Abbey Islands grazed during the summer. And the grazing is informed by ecological surveys. It's actually quite a complex operation because the, the fence and the cattle have to be moved on a regular basis and it's all divided into compartments. Um, so that's kind of coordinated by our team on the ground. That's kind of James and Michael John and uh, Chris McGuire as well and our seasonal geopat. So they're doing a fantastic job on many fronts. Um, there's a PhD research project as well um, over a kind of multi-year period that's monitoring the impacts of kind of cattle on the grazing and the impact of tourism on the, the kind of grassland habitat. Um, this is one of the Natajak toad ponds here. Like our staff also carry out maintenance of these in dialogue with the National Parks and Wildlife team and under their supervision. <laughs> And that's mainly to ensure that the ponds don't become choked up with vegetation, that the, the grass around the edge is kind of kind of quite a low sward, and that there's areas for kind of toads to grow into in um, the, the kind of immediate environment. Um, and we're also exploring the possibility of creating new ponds with NPWS. They're actually they have a lot of initiatives taking place in Kerry and Wexford and in relation to. Um, encouraging landowners to create ponds and by us creating more ponds at Derry Nan as well, 
it will just give the, the toads the kind of opportunity to kind of step into the rest of South Kerry and repopulate the county. So now that's a really quick overview, but um, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, something maybe a little bit unusual, dried and frozen plants rather than uh, nice fresh living stuff that we've seen already, so for example, in Rory's. Um, and I, of course, this is not what uh, the only thing the Botanic Gardens do. We, we deal with um, uh, ecosystems such as habitat mapping. We deal at a species level, looking at classifying species and, and naming species. And we look at a genetic level in terms of uh, populations or provenance. But I'm going to focus today just on these two uh, possibly more unusual aspects of work in specifically in the herbarium. So the herbarium is this uh, repository of dried specimens. So here you see a, a cabinet of uh, dried specimens, these flattened dried specimens. And we have about 600,000 of them and we're currently on, uh, doing a project to digitize them, which is to capture the image and capture all the information uh, inside those specimens. So you might ask, well, what use really is uh, a dried specimen in biodiversity? And an example here is the CP, and you can see the specimen uh, here on the right. And the, the key thing really with these specimens are the labels. So I've just blown up this, this part of the label. And so although this is, um, you know, it's not living anymore, we have all the information about it. We have its name. We have where it was collected, even some, some bit about the habitat. Uh, and then we have who collected it and when it was collected. So we know that in 1845, in July of 1845, uh, uh, in Calorgan Bay, this plant was found. And we even know uh, physically what it was like at, in July in 1845 because we have it captured uh, physically. But if you look at the current uh, uh, data on the distribution, we find that it's not in Calorglan anymore, and it's only in Ross Carberry. So even just this one specimen tells us that basically we have we can tell about the distribution of plants. So we can we can tell about gains and losses as we get all of this data uh, digitized and available publicly. People can be using this to. Uh, to understand past events and predict future events in terms of climate change, for example. Um, and not only that, as I mentioned, the physical specimen itself is really rich and we are, it is yet untapped. We, we, uh, one of the few things we've done is extract DNA from the specimen and we've looked at uh, genetic data dating back to 1804, for example. But there's a whole slew of, of uh, potential uh, in the physical specimen that we haven't got to yet. The other um, aspect then, or project that I wanted to mention is um, uh, seed banks. These are, uh, seeds are unusual stores in a way. They're, they're great stores of genetic diversity. You have in, in the seed all the, the, the uh, genotype captured. And the great thing is we can actually store it for long-term uh, in the likes of this. This is a, uh, the global seed vault. You might be familiar with it up in Svalbard. Uh, in the Arctic Circle. And in, in this global seed vault, you have crops, like our varieties of crops. And here's an example of uh, some uh, heritage varieties we have collected in, in the herbarium. Um, but so while these are crops, we, we're sort of gearing more towards wild plants. And as part of uh, the Seeds for Nature, this was the first national biodiversity conference in 2019, the OPW committed to developing a national seed bank in the Botanic Gardens. And uh, all the, the team in the herbarium has re have really focused on this in the past year. So we have all the equipment in place and we've started collecting. And so the equipment is dryers, freezers, uh, sieves, all this to, to basically maintain these specimens, uh, you know, for, for years um, in, in these freezers. And just a, a, as an example, we're going to be focusing on collecting over the next few years. Some examples are uh, the more threatened species. On the, on the left here is the sea cotton weed, and it's, it's a coastal plant, so this would be threatened uh, by coastal dynamics. There's a lot of change in the coast, like I showed in the CP. Another example would be a montane species, such as this saxifrage, uh, the alpine saxifrage. And this 
will be outcompeted uh, uh, as climate changes and becomes more warm. It'll be outcompeted by other species. Um, and a final example is uh, a wetland. So our wetlands are um, are precious. And so this example here is the slender ball cotton, which uh, only occurs really in quaking Mars. There's there's not very many quaking Mars. So in, in short, what we aim to do is essentially collect from all our taxa. We will have about uh, a thousand species, and then we'll also move into to bryophytes uh, or, or mosses. And so we'll have a collection of all our, uh, our plants in store as seed, and then we'll develop that in terms of expanding out in terms of different populations. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them and I'll just stop sharing.